Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lima Baptist Temple Online. My name is Ben Anderson, and I'm an associate pastor here at the church. And we are so thankful. We're excited that you guys are joining us from wherever you are. It's going to be an amazing morning. Pastor Al is wrapping up the message series called Who's Your One, uh, where he's been taking us on a journey and helping us discover what our role is in leading other people to Jesus. So at the beginning of the series, he challenged us to find that one person that we can pray over uh, for the month of October and look for opportunities to share Jesus. Uh, we turned those names in. Uh, we laid them down front at the altar and had an awesome time of prayer. And we are just looking forward to what God is going to do um, in and through Who's Your One. And we're especially excited as we wrap up that series today because we know God is going to do awesome things uh, as we finish up that series today. And the message is called It's a Wonderful Life. So make sure you stay tuned in throughout that whole uh, service today. As always, we'd love to hear from you guys. We'd love to interact with you. We'd love to hear how God is working in your life. We'd love to hear your prayer requests. So go ahead, you can type those in the comments there. You can send us a direct message on Facebook. Even better, you can head on over to what we call the Central Hub. You can find that at limabaptisttemple.org slash central hub. And here you can send us a message. You can ask us a question. Uh, but most of all, we just love to hear from you. Um, every once in a while, I like to do a few uh, shout outs to different people that are watching. So let me kind of hop on here. Hey, Jessica, we are glad to have you joining us. Hey, Jed, Jennifer, great to have you joining us this morning. Um, Kim, Denise, Kara, so many people. Um, and I could keep going, but thanks for joining us. We love just being able to worship together, no matter our life circumstances or what's going on. Um, but as always, I want to challenge you guys, if you have not had a chance to visit us in person, I encourage you to do so. And if you're wondering what that might look like, um, you can go again, go to our website, limabaptisttemple.org, and go to um, the visiting section that talks all about what you can expect when you come to Lima Baptist Temple for the very first time. But again, as always, one of the best places to go to stay up to date with everything that's going on here at the church is that central hub. There's a tab there called events, and that will kind of take you through all the bigger church-wide things that are going on throughout this next month. So make sure you guys check those out, see what's going on, see what you want to get involved in. Uh, you can even, uh, while you're on the Central Hub, check out other things like different small groups. Um, if you want to uh, take the step of baptism in your life and get baptized, you can do that as well and let us know uh, via the Central Hub. But most importantly, we just wanna hear from you. We wanna see how God is working in your life and how we can come alongside of you and partner with you and serve you and just meet you right where you are um, no matter what's going on in your life. So make sure, uh, let us know you're here. You can do that on the Central Hub or on the website. And you can just let us know how we can pray for you. But today, Pastor Al is wrapping up uh, the Who's Your One series. And if you remember, he's been taking us on this journey of sharing with us what our role is in helping lead people <clears throat> into a personal relationship with Jesus. So today we're gonna to finish that up and we have just been thrilled and excited about what God has been doing through the Who's Your One series. And it's neat to hear the different stories about how you've been praying for your one or sharing Jesus with them and how God has been working in their lives. So even though the series is coming to an end today, uh, we wanna challenge you guys, keep praying for those individuals keep uh, looking for ways to serve them, meet them right where they are so that you can have opportunities to share Jesus uh, with those around you. But today is gonna be an awesome morning. We have a great um, worship set lined up for you guys. And then Pastor Al's going to close out today with the last message in the Who's Your One series. But as always, we are so thankful that you guys are joining us from wherever you are, and we are expecting God to do awesome things this morning. Thanks so much for worshiping with us.
temple. It's so great to see all of you, and uh, we are so ready to worship with you. Why don't you go ahead, stand, and let's do that together right now. I got my cheat sheets out today so I don't forget stuff. Our theme this year for Appreciation of Sunday is Superheroes. The Children's Department has a video that we'd like for you to watch this morning. It's Past Appreciation. Happy Past Appreciation. Happy Pastor Asian. Pastor Appreciation. Happy Pastor Appreciation. Pastor! His private hero is Batman. Uh, Jonah and the Whale. Cool. Oh. Daniel and the Lion's Den. Adam. He's afraid of monsters, too. The dark. He is afraid of snakes. The dark. Snakes! 
Bears, deer, anything that has teeth. Singing, Singing in the shower. shower. The devil. He's very friendly. Super speed. His superpower is eating. He's good at hunting, and he's silly, and he's very good at telling stories. Fresh the Gary! About, about Jesus. Jesus being crucified. I'm going to say Adam and Eve. Mary? Uh, snakes. Fish. Spiders. Telekinesis. Um, he's good at making things? Uh, I, I don't know him. We don't know. That's the best. David and Goliath. Nose art. I don't know. Snapping turtles. A rat too. Spiders. Not be able to take his speeches. Uh, he lost his voice. Visible. He's good at. Talking in front of the church. Uh, um, his wife. Um, he has good. Me, um, he has good speeches. Pastor oh. Dada. I don't know. No one in the ark. And Solomon. Jesus getting crucified. Matthew. He's afraid of monsters. Spiders. He is afraid of claw swipes. The fast air. The coming old. Running. Hilarious. Um. Good at preaching and he. It's fun. Laser eyes. He's great. Pastor Robin. Or is it David? Is it David in the lion pit? No. Or Daniel in the lion pit. David and Goliath. Paul. <laughs> Butterflies. Flapping birds. Snakes. Dinosaurs. That he'll Spiders. Make up his music. Uh, Spiders. A day of silence. Oh. Flying. He's really good at singing. Dieting. Singing. Uh, he has a powerful music? voice. There's your, su there's your superheroes out there. Thanks for the children's department for their video. Nice, good laughs. I'd like for now to have the pastoral staff and their mates come up, and we'll recognize you as you come. Looks like the best dress is Jenna and John. They did well. I like to start out with the best looking, so what about, no, maybe. <laughs> Let's go with Jenna, what the heck. Start out with the children's programs. Jenna helps take care of the nursery and lines up the nursery helpers, the Sunday school and the Sunday school teachers, 
the VBS. And this year we had 209 kids involved in VBS and 71 volunteers. The Awana on Wednesday nights, which is around 100 kids that we're having this year and all the volunteers to help there. And small groups, which we have 115 adults in, included in small groups. So thank you to all the volunteers and all that Jenna does. And her husband, John, helps out. Next, next I'd like to uh, uh, congratulate Michael Green and the job he does with the teens in the college and his wife, Rachel. And I don't know if this is Wesley or Waylon. Wesley. Waylon's back there waving. He... But this is our student pastor and tech media director. He takes care of the teens in college, makes sure the sound goes well, the TV goes well for us, and all the people that help him out, he's appreciative of. I forgot, I got all these cards and I forgot, this is something that Jenna did during VBS. And let's do, have a shout out to... <laughs> We're thankful for all those volunteers that they get. I told her I was going to do that, and she didn't know what I was going to do. But that's what happens. Michael has 50 to 60 young adults that he helps mentor, and we're appreciative for all that Michael does. <laughs> Next, we have superhero Gary Hall, <laughs> Pastor Gary. And you know what all he takes care of. B's been in the hospital. She just got home on Friday. She's recovering, and we're, we thank you for watching B. Uh, pastor, he's our pastor to the senior adults. <laughs> Sunday school on, on Sunday morning. He does solid food Bible study on Tuesday mornings. He does Wednesday Bible study. And all of us appreciate him for the knowledge that we get to glean from him and all the other extra stories that he brings to us. So thanks for Pastor Al. Gary. <laughs> Next, I got to go back to Pastor Robin and his wife, and his wife Danielle. <laughs> Wait a minute here. <laughs> got a fan club. Uh, he's our worship pastor. Heads the praise team, helps teach college classes, mentors men such as Aaron Blevins, who would be appreciative of, for what all he's done, and, and some other men that are here. Thank you for Pastor Robin. <laughs> we, get, we make it to Pastor Ben. He's our administrative and discipleship pastor. He oversees our welcome team, makes sure we're getting welcome as we come in. He heads the membership class, making sure that we have prospective members come in and have the class about quarterly or semi-yearly. He helps teach the college class also with Robin and Michael. And he fills in all the other gaps that need filled in. He's a pretty handy guy. Thank you for Pastor Ben. I got to find something. Here's our senior pastor, Pastor Al, and his lovely wife, Lori. Lori helps out with the praise and worship team. Number one thing he's supposed to be doing here is preach the word. Eric Fleck told me that, <laughs> so I had to bring that up. But that's the number one thing he's supposed to be doing. So whatever you don't see out of him, preaching the word's number one. Wednesday Bible studies, marriage retreats that he goes on, him and his wife conduct, funerals and baptisms. Gary does funerals on the side also. We've had a plethora of baptisms this year, a number. We appreciate to see new baptisms come up. You get to see the church grow, and hopefully they get discipled, and then they become volunteers and Sunday school teachers and deacons and whatever else we need to do here at our church. But we thank you for leading us for what we do here at uh, Lima Baptist Temple. And now, Aaron Blevins is going to come and sing a song for us. I want you guys to stand with me. We're going to pray a, a blessing over our staff. 
uh, and just really love on them this morning. So will you guys sing with me? We're going to sing the song called The Blessing. Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're rejoicing he is with you, he is for you. Amen. 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 pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for each and every uh, staff member, God, of this church. God, the things that they do, not just on Sunday, not just the things that we see when we're here, God, but the things they do behind the scenes, the things they do throughout the week. God, I thank you so much for them and for what they do in serving you. God, the calling that you've placed on their life and their willingness to give everything that they have for your service, God, and for bringing people uh, to the saving knowledge of you. God, I thank you for them. I pray, God, like we just sang, a blessing over them. God, bless them uh, for, you, for willing, being willing to be used. God, I pray that you bless their families, God, for all the time that they sacrifice uh, in service here, God, the things that they will give up sometimes in their service. God, I pray that you bless them in a very special way. We pray this all in your most holy and precious name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. All right. Well, as they are exiting the stage, I just want to welcome everybody to our service today. We are so thankful you are joining us. If you are visiting for maybe the first time or the second time, or we just have not had the chance to meet you yet, one of the best ways to do that is immediately following the service. You can head out on into the Welcome Center. Uh, we have a special gift for you. Um, or if you want to be a little bit more anonymous, you can head on over to our website, limabaptisttemple.org. Look for the guest graphic that is on the screen and fill that out. And somebody from our team will follow up with you. But I think I can say on behalf of all the pastoral team uh, here that we really consider it a privilege uh, to serve you guys and work uh, every day just to meet you guys where you are and help with whatever it is so we are so thankful for your generosity and uh, just the privilege it is uh, to serve you guys but let's go ahead and pray as we continue to worship father we are thankful for each person that's here and we're thankful for lima baptist temple and we're thankful for our deacons and leadership and pastors and father we're thankful for uh, just everybody here that considers it a team effort. Uh, we are called to be the body of Christ and we each have a unique role to play. Um, and I'm thankful for everybody stepping up to the plate to find those roles to serve people so that we can go out and live our mission. And that's three simple words, go, serve, and love. We're called to uh, go into the world and share the gospel and uh, we're called to serve people. And all of that is powered by our love 
for you. But Father, I pray over Pastor Al as he wraps up the Who's Your One series today, and he's been taking us on this journey of what it looks like to lead people into a personal relationship with you. And Lord, I just pray that all of us would have our hearts ready for what the Holy Spirit has for us today. We just thank you and praise you for it all. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Why don't you go ahead and stand once again and let's continue to worship. Sing together. Come on, you women. Return. And all my hope 
seated. Let's continue to worship.
your Lord. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And you've also told us, God, that uh, faith without works is dead. You showed your love for us, not just by good feeling or strong words, but by the death of your son, the shedding of his blood for us. You acted at the precise moment when mankind needed it desperately and because of that we are here this morning you praising you in freedom we thank you in jesus name amen well amen amen if you have your bibles open to john the gospel of john chapter one um one reason i did this series uh is because there is a lot of things going on today people ask me pastor do you think we are living in our last days. Do you think Jesus is coming soon? Well, the answer I always have is, I just know it's one day closer today than it was yesterday. Amen? And I do believe that we are in the last days. I still believe that there's going to be another great outpouring of God's Spirit for revival. That's the way I'm just kind of believing and praying and hoping for. But people, we never know. We never know when the last day is. Amen? And I'm telling you, today, uh, we started, and I'll remind some of you men, we started a new study last Wednesday evening, uh, and it starts at 6.30 back here in the cross training room in the back, but uh, on the book of Jude, and one of our deacons, uh, John Booker, our children's director's uh, husband, uh, very good teacher, and uh, we couldn't even get past, of course, you know, the first three verses, but we have begun that study, and, and basically what that's talking about is uh, the judgment on false teachers. False doctrine, and you need to understand that there's a lot of that that goes on today. Anybody agree with that? But one thing, as long as I'm pastor at this church, that will never happen from this pulpit. You need to understand that. But I just think that today, more than ever, we need to know that we know. That we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So today, we close out our series, Who's Your One? And I hope by now that you know the one person who God has led you to, to pray for, and to share with. And this morning, I want to start with a question. What makes a wonderful life for the kingdom of God? How does God himself define a well-lived life? In just a minute, I want uh, us to watch a clip uh, from a movie, one of my favorites of all time. It's a wonderful life. How many of you have ever, ever, yeah, multiple times? And just let, the know, let those of you know who may not have seen that, okay? Who are not familiar with this movie. This is about a man named, who is it? George Bailey. And he works for a building and loan company. And there is an evil man named, anybody know that? Mr. Potter. That is on the board of the bank. And through a series of circumstances, on Christmas Eve, Uncle Billy loses The business is $8,000 while intending to deposit in the bank. Well, Mr. Potter finds the misplaced money and hides it. That's not nice, is it? And when the bank examiner discovers that shortage later that night, George realizes that he will be held responsible and sent to jail, and the company will collapse. So George is broken. And he becomes suicidal over the misplacing of the $8,000 and other things going on in his life. And this funny man, his guardian angel, Clarence, falls to earth literally to show him some stuff and get his attention. So we'll pick up their conversation right here. Hey, what's what's with you? What did what, you say just a minute ago? Why do you want to save me? That's what I was sent down for. I'm your guardian angel. 
I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Ridiculous of you to think of killing yourself for money. Eight thousand dollars. Yeah, now, think, just things like that. Now, how do you know that? I told you I'm your guardian angel. I know everything about you. Well, you look about like the kind of an angel I'd get. Sort of a fallen angel, aren't you? What happened to your wings? I haven't worn my wings yet. That's why I'm an angel second class. I don't know whether I like it very much being seen around with an angel without any wing. Oh, I've got to earn them. And you'll help me, won't you? Sure, sure. How? By letting me help you. Yeah. Only one way you can help me. You, you don't happen to have 8,000 bucks on you. Oh, you? no, no. We don't use money in heaven. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> Comes in pretty handy down here, bub. Oh, tut, tut, tut. Yeah. <laughs> I found it out a little late. I'm worth more dead than alive. Now, look, you mustn't talk like that. I won't get my wings with that attitude. You just don't know all that you've done. If it hadn't been for you... Yeah, it... if it hadn't been for me, everybody would be a lot better off. My wife and my kids and my friends. And my... Look, little fella, why you go off and haunt somebody else. No, you? now you don't understand. I've got my job. Oh, shut up, will you? Oh, this isn't going to be so easy. Yeah, so you still think killing yourself would make everyone feel happier, right? Eh? Oh, I don't know. I guess you're right. I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. Oh, you mustn't say things like that. You... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an idea. What do you think? Yeah, that'll do it. All right. You've got your wish. You've never been bored. You don't have to make all that fuss about it. Well, most of you have seen that movie uh, multiple times, uh, long as, uh, just like I have. But the reason I played that clip was because the message today is called, It's a Wonderful Life. And George Bailey is a man who does not understand the value of his life. He begins to think and ask the question, would it be better if I had never been born? And as a pastor, you will be amazed at how many people have looked at me and said, Pastor, it probably would have been better off if I would have never been born. And as we conclude this series of Who's Your One today, we want to focus on how important each individual life is. How important it is for each of us to understand that a wonderful life is, especially in the kingdom of God, we need to understand that it is determined by God. That's what our life is. It's not just determined by others, it's determined by God. It is not something we define for ourselves, but something that he defines for us. Today, we're going to look at the life of Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And his life is one that sort of kind of goes into the shadows, one that's not really paid a lot of attention to. So let's look at John chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 40 through 42. John chapter 1. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Peter's brother Andrew is the least known of the four disciples in the inner circle. Andrew originally is left uh, very much in the background. And we will learn that he was used by the Lord's uh, touch just when he touched one, okay? Think about it. When he just touched one that touched thousands. I refer to Andrew as the inviter, or I see him as the bringer or the introducer. Had Andrew never been born, 
the New Testament could have changed significantly. Peter may have never been saved. Someone else would have preached the famous Pentecost sermon. So much for 3,000 being saved in one day. We would have to eliminate two books of the New Testament, First and Second Peter. Who would have brought the little boy? You remember the little boy with the two fish and five loaves? Would there have been the miracle and great biblical lesson that we learn from the story of feeding 5,000 men plus the women and children? Only heaven knows what else would have been left out of the Bible and church history. We need to understand that Andrew was the first of all the disciples to be called. In his eagerness to follow Christ, combined with his zeal for introducing others to Christ, fairly typifies Andrew's character. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And certainly Andrew was the least conspicuous. Scripture doesn't really tell us a lot about him. He appears in the New Testament only nine times, and most references simply mention him in passing. Andrew lived his life in the shadows of better known of his better known brother Peter. Now you know Peter was he didn't he, <laughs> he didn't pay much attention sometimes to what he said. He just said what was there, right? He just kind of blurted it out. He is even mentioned in text as Simon Peter's brother. However, lest we forget, Andrew introduced Peter to Jesus. So Andrew shows that he had the right heart for the effective ministry in the background. And of the four here, Andrew appears to be the least contentious and the most thoughtful. Peter was impetuous and often said the wrong thing at the wrong time. He was brash, hasty, and downright impulsive. John and James were nicknamed sons of thunder because of their reckless tendencies. Andrew would be a great model for church ministry because most will labor in relative obscurity. He was indeed the opposite of the renowned and prominent. Andrew's name means manly. If you remember, he was a fisherman. So he was a strong fisherman who his life proved him to be bold, decisive, and deliberate. He was driven by a hearty passion for the truth and was willing to subject himself to the most extreme kinds of hardship. Andrew's personal encounter with Jesus took place a few months after Jesus' baptism. And Andrew and John were standing next to John the Baptist when Jesus walked by and John the Baptist said, you remember these words? Behold the Lamb of God. Andrew and John became Jesus' first disciples. The news that Andrew heard was, to keep, was too good to keep to himself. So he went and found one person, the one person in the world he most loved, whom he most wanted to get to know Jesus and led him to Christ. And that was his brother. Andrew played an unsung role in obscurity. However, when Andrew, whenever he does not come to the forefront, the thing that shines is his uncanny ability to see immense value, don't miss this, to see immense value in small and modest things. So number one, it's a wonderful life when you see the value of individual people. He saw the value of individual people. Andrew appreciates the value of a single soul. He was known, listen, he was brought, known for bringing individuals, not crowds, to Jesus. Almost every time you see him in the gospel, and whatever the gospel accounts, he is bringing someone to Jesus. So he brought Peter to Jesus, just one. He brought the boy with his lunch to Jesus, just one. And that's what I have been asking you to do during this series. All of us need to see the value of individual people, if it's just one. Andrew has been referred to as the first 
home missionary. And also as the first foreign missionary. Because of the Greeks he brought to Jesus in John chapter 12. Most people do not come to Christ as an immediate response to a sermon they hear in a crowded setting. Just like today. It's a pastor's desire that gives the pastor no more satisfaction than to see somebody come to Jesus here during a service. But you need to understand that there are many that come to know the Lord after this service. Where we'll get a text, or we'll get a phone call, or we'll get an email, or people will just say, Pastor, I didn't come down, but. But listen, they come to know Jesus. Andrew brought one. You see, they come to Christ because of the influence of an individual. That's why I have, again, have asked each of you to just find your one. Pray for them, invite them, and share with them. Andrew brought one, Peter. Peter then brought how many? Thousands. All the fruits of Peter's ministry is ultimately also the fruit of, An of, of Andrew's faithful individual witness. Few have ever heard of Edward Kimball. He was a Sunday school teacher who led Dwight L. Moody to Christ. Now, how many has heard of Dwight L. Moody? The Moody Bible Institute. Edward went to a Boston shoe store where the 18-year-old Moody was working. And he cornered him in the stock room and introduced him to Christ. Now, Kimball was anything but bold. He was a timid, soft-spoken man. He went to that store frightened, trembling, and unaware of whether he had the courage to confront this young man with the gospel. Moody, on the other hand, was crude and obviously illiterate. And Kimball trembled in his boots as he recalled the incident. Moody had begun to attend his Sunday school class. Moody was totally untaught and ignorant about the Bible. There's something in Acts about that. They were just unschooled, ordinary men. Remember that? Kimball said, I decided to speak to Moody about Christ and about his soul. I started downtown to Holton's shoe store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether I ought to go just then during business hours. And I thought maybe my mission might embarrass the boy, that when I went away, the other clerks might ask who I was. And when they learned uh, that, 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 might, that I would might taunt Moody and ask if I was trying to make a good boy out of him, well, while I was pondering over it all, I passed the store without noticing it. Then when I found I had gone by the door, I determined to make a dash for it and have it over at once. Kimball found Moody in the stock room and spoke to him with limping words. Later he said, I never could remember exactly what I said. Something about Christ and his love, that was all. He admitted it was a very weak appeal, but Moody then and there gave his heart to Christ. Listen, I've said this before. If you're in here today and you're a Christian and you knew that God was going to be back today before I got through preaching, but you knew that you needed some scripture to share with somebody, I promise you, you can find something in this word when it comes time. There are people, listen, it's amazing what you can do if you know that your last day is today. It's amazing what we can do. It is amazing. But all we're needing to do is be faithful in finding that one and realize how significant they really, really are. You see, tens of thousands testified that they came to Christ under Moody's ministry. Moody led C.T. Studd, who I love. The great pioneer missionary and William Chapman, who himself became a well-known evangelist to Christ. Moody founded the Moody Bible Institute that has trained thousands for ministry. And you know what? It all just began with one who was faithful to introduce another to Christ. You see, Andrew understood the value of befriending just one. And again, that's all I've been asking you to do for these five weeks you have no idea the impact of the one you share with that may have on the kingdom of God. Two weeks ago, I said this. We're prone to think of one as small and insignificant. 
Again, who wants just one cookie? Who wants just one Lay's potato chip? Who wants just, you know, one dollar? What's the value of one dollar? Or worse yet, one penny? Or one point? But the Bible consistently speaks of one. Remember, one pearl of great price. One lost son, one wayward son. One, I mean, lost sheep. Christians often overlook the value of one. What if you knew? What if you knew that the one that God has put on your heart, and you still ain't had the boldness, the courage to share, but God's told you. Maybe you prayed for him. But if you knew that thousands would come to know the Lord because you witnessed to them, would it change what you're doing now? Listen. Christians continue to overlook the value of one. One invitation to church. One message of hope. One neighbor, one co-worker, one friend. Can you name one person who has come to Christ through your invite and witness? Don't ever underestimate what your one may become for Christ. Number two, he saw the value of insignificant gifts. Some people see the big picture more clearly just because they appreciate the value of small things. In the feeding of the 5,000 story, Philip's vision was overwhelmed by the size of the need. Andrew said in John 6, verse 9, there is a lad who has five loaves and two small fish. You see, Andrew knew that Jesus would not issue such a command without making it possible for them to obey. See, Jesus is never going to tell you to go witness to somebody that he hasn't already gone before you with. We need to understand that. Some, something in him seemed to understand that no gift is insignificant if it is in the hands of Jesus. There's an amazing lesson here. It's that so little could be used to accomplish so much was a testimony to the power of Christ. No gift is really insignificant in his hands. Do you remember the song, Little is Much, when God is in it? Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. You see, God's ability... To use a gift is no way hindered or enhanced by the size of that gift. It is the sacrificial faithfulness of the giver, not the size of the gift. That is the true measure of the gift's significance. Several have asked me, especially this year, even last year during the pandemic, how are we continuing? To meet the budget with less people since the pandemic. You know what I tell them? Because of the faithfulness of God through the sacrificial giving and faithfulness of obedience of all of you. Only God. That's the only answer I have. Only God. When we can figure it out, it must not be of God. Amen? Remember, only God can do it. Just like he did with the widow. And in Andrew's life. It's not the greatness of the gift that counts, but the rather the greatness of the God who is in the given. Amen. Andrew set the stage for a miracle, so that's what he did. So the miracle of feeding five thousand, it really illustrates the way that God works. He takes the sacrificial in the insignificant gifts of people who give faithfully, and he multiplies them to accomplish monumental things. Lastly, he saw the value of inconspicuous service. Andrew is the picture of all those who labor quietly in humble places. He never wanted to draw attention to himself. In the book of Ephesians, see this. Not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, 
but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You see, his ministry was a place of support. He did not mind being hidden as long as the work was being done. He was a leader with a servant's heart. Andrew never preached to multitudes or founded any churches. Tradition also has it that Andrew took the gospel north into Russia and possibly Scotland. He was ultimately crucified in Achaia, which is in, the southern, in southern Greece near Athens. One account says he led a wife of a provincial Roman governor to Christ and that it infuriated her husband. He demanded that his wife just recant her devotion to Jesus, and she refused. So you know what? The governor had Andrew crucified. He was lashed to the cross instead of nailed. You know why? In order to prolong his suffering. Can I ask you a question? What's the worst thing somebody's going to do to you when you said, can I tell you about my Jesus? What's the worst thing, people? Tradition says it was an X-shaped cross. Most, most accounts say he hung on the cross for two days, exhorting passers-by to turn to Christ for salvation. Thank God for people like Andrew. Great individuals, but inconspicuous, giving insignificant, sacrificial gifts who accomplish the most for the Lord. You see, in effective ministry, it's often the little things that count. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29 says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So as we conclude this series today, who's your one? That's my question. We want to remember how important an individual life is. How important it is to understand that it is a wonderful life, especially in the kingdom of God. It is not something we define for ourselves, but something that he defines for us. Now, last week, when I talked about hell, I said a lot. Let me just remind you of some things. I said hell is full of people that never intended to go there. They had good intentions. Eternity is too long to be wrong. But one of the main points I said, we've forgotten where we're headed to the point that we no longer tell others where they're headed. You remember in Acts 4, when Peter and John were brought before the council? And the Sadducees were annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus' resurrection. So they arrested him. They arrested both of them. Look at this. So they called them and charged them and not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Well, a couple things here. One is, I am telling you to do the opposite. You have the authority by Jesus Christ and the love of your pastor to go and tell and speak the things that Jesus has done in your life and not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can these words be said of you? God, I can't help but speak what you've done in my life. I can't help but speak what you've done about it. What the things that I've seen. And the only way they can hear is for you and I to tell them. With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, please, as we end this today. Every head bowed and every eye closed as we prepare for invitation. If you've never been saved, if you say, Pastor, if I die today, I don't know that I would go to heaven. And I want to settle this once and for all. This morning... I want to repent of my sins and place my faith in Jesus Christ. 
If that is the desire of your heart and you believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, you are acknowledging you're a sinner. You're sorry for your sin. You acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross in your place. And you want to receive his free gift of eternal life. If that's your desire, would you ask him right now? Just make this prayer your prayer. Just pray this silently to yourself. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Would you please come into my life and save me? Cleanse me of my sins. Come live in me. I give you my life, and I receive your life. I place my faith and trust in you. God, help me to live the remaining days of my life for Jesus. Now, with heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer just now, then you've just made the most important decision in your life. And in just a second, we're going to stand, and I'm going to ask you to come to the front, and I want to pray for you and give you a gift that will help you grow in Christ. For others in here today, maybe you need to come today and just continue to pray. For your one, pray that God would give you the boldness to share with your one. For many in here today, some of you, you have just felt beaten down. The world has been rough on you. Some of you have broken marriages. Some of you have broken families. Some of you just have health issues and whatever it may be. This place that we are in today is a hospital for sinners. And all of us are sinners. And we need to acknowledge that today. So whatever your need is today, the altar will be open. Father God, I would pray today that people would be obedient to you, whatever you have called them to do. Lord, for the ones that maybe have prayed that prayer today, that, God, they would come and confess you publicly as Lord and Savior. For others, God, that they would just need to come and pray, whether it's for their one, for their own life, for things that are going on there. Lord, you know their hearts. So today, God, I pray that your will will be done in this place. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Would you sing? And would you come today? All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will live love and trust Him in His prayer
I would, boy, Lord is so good. Before we close today, uh, I want to remind all of you that next Sunday is a, uh, a big Sunday because it's uh, the Lord's Day, of course. But, you know, I've, I've told some of y'all, you've seen it, that we did two, I did two messages on baptism. Breaking it down, explaining it, and the first time I think we had two that were ready to be baptized, and we ended up with 26 that day. How many of you remember that? The next time we had one or two, we ended up with 20. As of today, I don't know of anybody, but it doesn't really matter because that's how God works. And so next Sunday, I will be preaching a baptism message. I would pray that you'd go out of here and pray that God would send all of those. And some of you in here probably really need to be baptized. And I mean, it's going to be a day of celebration. It's the day that we're asking all of you to wear your favorite uh, team shirt or jersey. And we'll have a reason for that. We'll be talking about that next week. Uh, before Pastor Gary comes, I'm going to ask uh, Aaron Blevins if he'll come down here. And Gary, when you dismiss us today, I just want you to pray for Aaron. Aaron's last uh, Sunday is today. He's going to be going joining his wife and them. He uh, is on staff now at Grace Baptist in Fetville, North Carolina. Uh, I tell you, I, I just, I'm going to miss him. I already have been missing him, even though he's been here. And uh, his voice, his heart, his passion. And uh, I just ask today, uh, I'm going to ask him to actually stand down here at the end of the service. You come and just tell him goodbye. Most of you know his family. But, but dude, I love you. You're, you're just a great guy. And I love you and love your family. And I want you to know if there's anything that I can do, this church can do, we're always here for you. And we're proud to know that we helped send you out of this place. Amen, Pastor Gary. And now, Lord, we are so much like Andrew, who was spoken of today. Most of us are in the background. Most of us don't consider ourselves to be very important. But, Lord, we realize, as we've heard today, the value of just one person who will speak to someone else. Lord, I pray that we might become more like Andrew today, that we might have his boldness, and that we might have your leading in our lives as we seek to reach that one that we've prayed about and uh, looked forward to seeing come to Jesus. We pray that we might have that enthusiasm and that boldness. And now, Lord, we pray for Aaron. Thank you, Lord, for his testimony. Thank you, Lord, for the things that he's accomplished in his life. And now as you're leading him somewhere else, Lord, I pray that you just might be very near and dear to he and his family. And Lord, bless them in an abundant way. And I pray great victories will be won during that ministry that he has for you in the near future. And so, Lord, lead us, direct us. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And dismiss us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, to thee, my blessing.